Thank you, Rich. And uh, thank you all for coming. Actually, it's, for me, it's really a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful chance to uh, actually bring my sabbatical to a close here at UBC, which has been a fantastic time. Exchanges we had, many, and uh, I'm sure there will be more to come. And for me, so this is a good opportunity actually tonight to sum up a little bit, um, add to what I've brought here, and now it's mingling and uh, it's mixing with, uh, old and new ideas. Um, actually, some of them are as fresh as this morning. Um, so this is gives you uh, and gives you a pretty good idea of uh, what we are we will be able today to cover. Um, it's basically, as you've seen from the abstract, it's about the role and function of cultural capital in the reproduction of social inequalities and health inequalities. So, uh, but I think before I actually get into the introduction, I should have some notes of caution first. So, sorry, this is not a theory talk today. Um, and sorry again, this is not a report of empirical findings. So I'm not going to throw any statistical models at you. No coefficients today, I promise. Um, but it will be, hopefully, a mix uh, of things that you might be interested in. Um, what this is about, it's a report today, some 35 minutes, 40 minutes, I will take to report on an ongoing project which is actually developing, developing a theory-guided, empirically applicable, potentially public health relevant concept of cultural capital. That's the project. And uh, it may turn out in the end to be a live project. I don't know. And uh, not finished by the time I die. But basically, I think this is, um, gives a pretty good idea. So I'm coming from a public health perspective. I think that you should keep this in mind. I'm drawing on sociological theory. And I want to measure. That's what this uh, describes my concept. For those of you who are more curious about, uh, just uh, Rich just mentioned, our structure agency approach, the theory that's behind it. Uh, there's a paper just published or recently published, and there are others that describe all this more theoretical conceptually in more detail. Now, I think it's important that we start with the definition of what we mean by health. Um, I had a great experience that was something like a year ago when a very good colleague of mine, an epidemiologist, he said, oh, Thomas, I mean, I don't understand. Why do you make all this mess about defining health? It's easy. I can write it down, what health is. And he gave me his definition of health, and, and it was uh, death, uh, death minus one. <laughs> and that's exactly what we are faced with in, in much of public health research, in epidemiology. That is, what they are actually mean is illness when they talk about health. And in the worst case, it's death. It's so easy to measure mortality. And morbidity also, it's basically, relatively easy to measure. But it's not the same. And it's not just the opposite side of that coin, and that's what I'm trying to trying to develop a little further. So and I found uh, this IUHPE definition, which I think is quite informative. So it says that health is, uh, uh, is a fundamental requirement for functioning of individuals and societies. It is about the underlying factors that influence health. And it is about the living conditions and the behaviors. I like this definition. I think it's very useful in the social sciences. It will never be adopted in the medical sciences or in epidemiology. But it really helps us to make health a social topic for research. 
also important to say is that health is not a given. You may think, well, this is, uh, this is, we know all this. Well, no. When you look at the literature, very often you will find that they talk about maintaining health, prevention to maintain health. But health, I would say, needs to be produced. It's not there automatically at the very beginning. From day one on, health needs to be produced. And it's, and it's produced by the people, through the people, with the people, through the people actually, and here comes biology, and through their bodies health is produced. And it's by the people, because they all have to do something for it. And this production takes place under the conditions that society provides. And those conditions of the production of health in everyday life, they vary drastically. I think this photo doesn't need much of explanation about the social divide. But when we look at it, what we can see or what we can come up with questions. Structure, oh yes, there is oh, one so clearly to see. Is there behavior in it? Oh, definitely. It's all about structure and what people do on these structures, how they reproduce structures, what they do within the given structures. Now, conditions like this are very often studied with a social epi perspective. Social epidemiology studies these conditions. They look at risk factors over here. They look at diseases over here and not uh, the, uh, the uh, prevalence and incidence rates much lower here, much higher there, and then they look for risk factors. And that's fine. That's very important research. But I would argue it's not enough, and sometimes it leads us into wrong directions, including medical sociology research, I would say. Social epidemiology is basically, is based on a medical paradigm. Even if it's social epidemiology, it's a biomedical paradigm. Because it starts with the definition of a disease, otherwise there is no epidemiology. Epidemiology is defined as the, I don't know, if it's science, it's a methodology, as the methodology about the disease distribution in space and time. It's about the disease. So we start by defining a disease. And what is a disease? It's something that happens inside the human body. So it's bi uh, biomedical. It all starts with a biomedical conceptualization of the problem. And from there, very, you know, as a consequence, you have to look at risk factors. Factors associated with the occurrence of this disease inside a human body. And then you come to an understanding that people are actually hosts. The human body is the host of a risk factor or an agent, what they call. So people become carriers of risks. And that's basically what my colleagues in our department Many of them basically do. They study humans in their function as a carrier of risk. And they always look at individuals. Many individuals. Hopefully 30,000, whole cohort for many years. But basically it's individual. What I would argue is that these approaches and not only social epidemiologists, sometimes medical sociologists as well. They look at disease rather than health. They look at risk factors rather than resources. They look at people as carriers of risk rather than social age and individuals rather than context. So what we need is a social theory. A social theory on resources, and the inequality of resources, and human agency. And this is my starting point.
Now, resources and health. There's this very fundamental uh, distinction that we can make between material resources and non-material resources. And there are, there's a universe of studies that link them to health outcomes. When we look at material resources, economical capital is most often researched. And the pathways are quite clear, basically. So, given a certain income, you can afford healthy housing, which then impact on your health. Depending on which country and social system or medical system you live in, there's a strong thing with what you can afford in terms of possibility. Hopefully, it will improve your health chance. And link between income, health behaviors, and health. And this is the one um, in on my side, mostly. And I think it might not be as simple as it may look in the first place. Because we have a control that, for example, nutrition, that healthy food are more expensive. And there is a pretty clear link between uh, your income and your health nutrition. Makes a lot of sense. Even exercise, you can make this kind of an easy pathway through. That is, both exercises need some sort of to have to have the money. knowledge that actually will model the effect from income down to health behaviors. No idea, I know. I think the big parts of you have to come to the, how do you call this, the gate of the lion, I suppose? You have to be careful. <laughs> financial means to be a member. But often, I mean, if, if we are talking about the most powerful networks, it would be that you would have the, to pay the annual fee in the golf club. But even other uh, that are not high culture or whatever, you need some money. You need some money to interact with these people to go out, consume the same things that they do. So there is this dependence on uh, economic capital in social capital. But there's actually another effect there. In order to become a member of social capital rich networks, you need to have cultural resources. You need to speak their language. You need to understand their values. You need to share their values. Skills and norms. Not much research on that, I would say. So there are at least two unresolved issues when we talk about these types of capital and health. One is, I just mentioned that it's not quite clear where behavior and health are in and on the social capital. I would say, and I don't know if Richard agrees, but we can discuss about this later. That social structure 
is not really fully understood when it comes to the effect of social capital and health. So the, this, this effect of where you are on the social level. I think that when we turn to, when we look for some theoretical light thrown on these issues, Bourdieu is very helpful. French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu develops his theory of uh, capital and power and privilege. And I know he would turn in his grave if he would know that I talk about his theory something like in five minutes. Uh, thousands and thousands of pages. <laughs> I dare, anyway. And uh, I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. Now, but this theory of capital, he defines capital as accumulated labor. It can be in its materialized form or in corporate form. It is also, he says, the principle underlying the imminent regularities of the social world. Basically, I think what he's trying to say is that capital structures our society. That's basically, I mean, but he puts it much nicer. I know. But that's basically uh, what, what, how he defines capital. And then he distinguishes with, uh, the three different forms of capital, economic, social, and cultural capital. And the, I think the marriage of the two, it, he really brings it together in a coherent, explanation of the social reproduction of privilege and disadvantage. I find this helpful, uh, the three different types of capital, economic, social, and cultural, and the major currency, uh, Anhaya called it that way, uh, that the major currency for economic capital is money, for social capital it is social contacts and connections, and for cultural capital, it's, it's, it's knowledge. The basic di distinction that we can make is on economic capital, monetary success or failure. Here it is members versus non-membership. So either you make it into this powerful network or you don't. And cultural capital is recognition versus indifference. And usually we measure these things with economic status, membership in those networks, reputation, often education. What you call education the least inaccurate measure of cultural capital? Seems nice. The least inaccurate, uh, inaccurate measure. Is, uh... So here we are focusing on cultural capital. Cultural capital has been defined by Bourdieu and Rancourt as resources for action. And that's very important. It's for people, it's people use it for certain actions. And it's symbolic or it's informational, and we will see what this means. Yes, there's three different states of cultural capital incorporated, objectivized, and institutional. And I will take two minutes to explain what is meant by the three different states of cultural capital. And its institutionalized form is like what you already all have, and some of you will get more. That is, academic degrees. Very important. It's institutionalized. Uh, it's professional titles, and what they do, actually, they give legitimization. And, you know, I, you, I don't know if you have actually used it. Sometimes I use it. I have my secretary, you know, some instances I have my secretary calling somebody else and making clear that Professor Abel wants to talk. It works. It does make a difference. I use it like money. I use it like, like a currency. It is really somebody, some institution has given me the legitimization to display my superior status. 
works. I know here in North America, in Canada, definitely, it is not as often displayed as such. Well, I thought I may spend a little more time even here to find out how it is true. But as coming from a different culture, it's very difficult for me to see the, sub the subtleties. But um, I have the hunch that working here as well. Over there in Europe, it works like very direct. All the rest have some That's good. Over here, it works quite good, but I haven't figured it out how. Um, yeah, and it huge cred uh, credibility with all what you're saying. Write a letter to the newspaper and sign it, uh, the doctor or something. Oh, no, we don't do that. Maybe it's the European bias. Yeah, he was French. So, Roger was French. So, objectivized cultural capital. It's um, like this thing here. It's a laptop, a book, object, where there's actually culture in it. It's not just technical. Te uh, uh, it's not just technical advancements. It's actually culture that's in there. So, it's material representations of knowledge and community. Objectivized cultural capital, that's good. It's, it's uh, transferable. I can give this book to you. <laughs> and you have it. Other forms are not as easy. Uh, the utility depends on incorporated cultural capital. That's very important. If I give this book to you and you can't read it, because it's a German book, you would need the incorporated cultural capital of speaking this language in order to make use of that. So every objectivized cultural capital works if you don't have the means to use it. And the means usually are incorporated cultural capital. What is incorporated cultural capital? It's perceptions, skills, knowledge. It's acquired through social learning. We come back to this. It needs personal investment, time, and attention. So you cannot have it. Like, I give it to you, then you have it. No. Incorporate cultural capital cannot be given to a person. The person has to work, has to somehow take it in, incorporate it. Usually that works with social learning, but also with practice learning, tools, and so on. But it needs also affection. You have to be interested in it. And that's very important. It's bound to the individual, so it's not different. And as I said, I think it's absolutely using all other forms of capital. Now, the acquisition, I just mentioned that it is uh, social learning. It comes from social learning. But Jerry himself talked about cultural competencies. <laughs> Use basically element, key element of it. Whether it's performed within family, it's a, it's a broad concept of learning. Within the family, and it's extended throughout the life by scholastic, he called it scholastic. And Lamont and Leroux, uh, they talk about cultural goods and resources, also part of the culture. They say that it can be transmitted through past experience. And I think I basically agree this is where it all starts, but it doesn't end there. And I found that quote from social psychology, uh, developmental psychology. I like it. So we think of the fact that learning is something you do in school, but what happens in a family is able to learn in school. It's not because your parents teach you arithmetic. Because you learn from them how to relate to very complex things. And it's this kind of learning. It's not so much about cognitive uh, processes where you learn facts. It is actually you learn how to be successful in life. And that was really social, brings it in the real cultural capital. Now, when we look at 
institution diagnosis indicated to you educational degree, daily subscription, professional titles, or institutionalized culture terms, books, technical pieces of art. And we can talk about which of those are actually then relevant for health, incorporate cultural capital, social, technical knowledge, skills, actions, values, level one. Very important aspect in Bourdieu's capital theory is the action between different capitals, and it's also between states and cultural capital. So these three actually interact all the time. I gave you this example with a book. You need for objectivized cultural capital, uh, you have it uh, to have it working for you. You need incorporate. And for example, from knowledge, corporate, cultural, capital, you have this interaction to academic degrees. It's all the interplay that actually make it. To put this back in a broader perspective, this is our basic model. We look at behavioral transformation from social inequality to health and Based on our earlier work, lifestyles, health lifestyles, one example, how it works. Well, forgive me, I have all these medical outcomes here. I just realized I. <laughs> well, the quality of life is actually pretty good. And yet, now here we have the three forms of capital and the three states of culture. And the, I can, we can conceptualize this part of it. To give you one, I would say, very illustrated example of how economic, culture, and cultural capital, and social capital, how they work. Um, in Switzerland, where I live, by now 60% of all high school students, they get um, extras. I don't know what the term is, extra school training. So it's not within the school institution. Uh, it's actually outside. It's in the private sector where they are actually made fit for the final exams and so that they could make it actually then to the uh, undergraduate program. More than 60%. And uh, that's it. Yes, you come on. Imagine. So parents pay for extra training that their kids. Well, there must be something. I'm not quite sure. And uh, but maybe you are not aware of the numbers. But if you find them, look them up. It's interesting. Why is that interesting? Because what is happening here? The perfect transformation is what what you would have thought to be this. What happens is that family economic capital is invested in the cultural capital of them. these degrees. And then what happens then? It's a high likelihood that with these cultural capital that then the kids have, they go, they go on and get the better education. It works, comes back, economic capital into cultural capital, economic capital. And by the way, these people who have these academic degrees uh, and that money that they take to get them also a higher chance to do powerful networks. There we are. Capital. You see, that's the appeal of the theory, the interplay between all these different forms of research. This is what we produce. It's not from the single capital. And of course, in health research, we apply these to health relevant outcomes. And uh, we'll talk about this a little very soon. So, quick summary on cultural capital before we then move on to health relevant. What is the data? 
like, well, health is what I need to make it through. Actually, to make ends meet, I need my body to function. So that's health as a means. And it's only those who are beyond the necessities, as Bourdieu would say, uh, the sheer necessities in life that can enjoy health. I enjoy my health. I love it work out and things like that, I can afford it. So, and that is the basis of value systems for health. About knowledge, another example, knowledge as cultural capital relevant for health, well, the knowledge about how to relate health information that's around to your own social context. As you know, most prevention projects fail. The, and they serve only the middle classes. They serve them well. But from a public health perspective and the general population, they fail. Most of these are not adjusted to the real world of, let's say, working class people. Not at all. And it's very important that people actually have the ability to relate whatever information is out there to their own living conditions. Knowledge about the determinants of health, that's part of it. What makes me sick? What improves my health? It's not just, oh, I need to, it's not just, oh, I should work out regularly. It is also that, for example, yeah, shit. In this neighborhood, there are no playgrounds for my kids. I cannot send them out. There's, it just doesn't exist. The knowledge about the social determinants of health is part of people's cultural capital. The skills for fighting for healthy living conditions. While I was preparing for this talk, I thought about this. And, uh, and in fact, uh, I had a colleague at one university where, where I was working, and uh, he was very good in forming a 
neighborhood group around him when there were plans that there would be um, uh, that there would be uh, built residencies for migrants. I'm sorry for my poor English, but uh, you know when 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 you when when you try to pardon? social housing. Perfect. Thank you. So there was a social housing project, and her professor X was very good in fighting for that this would not happen because he said, well, this. You know, this will create all kinds of problems, crime and all this in my neighborhood, and I don't want it. Part of these NIMBYs, not in my backyard. It's a skill how you, uh, how you actually reiterate or how you reinforce your privileged positions. And social norms relating to health, well, the repertoire of behaviors that you have available that are actually acceptable in the uh, social contexts that you live in. That's all part of health-relevant cultural capital. Here's a distinction that I've come to make recently in tough discussions with Jerry. Um, I think what we need to do in the future, we need to distinguish between direct effects of cultural capital on health and indirect effects on health. The direct effects on health, many of them I just mentioned. You've seen them. So the knowledge about your body function, the knowledge about the conditions for your health, you can do something directly to it. But then there's this other part of research, medical source research, that actually mostly looks at indirect effects, that basically argues that cultural capital uh, defines your position in a social hierarchy, and with this position, there will be health advantages and disadvantages. But there is a problem with it, and especially me coming from public health, you know, I want to do research that at least has the potential to change things. And with this kind of approach, there's a black box problem. And what is it about this higher social class position that makes people healthy. There are, for example, studies that, that find correlations between uh, frequency of going to the opera and being in better health. Is that really the music? Probably not. So, then these researchers say, well, it's the social class. And I would say, yes. Great, that's what we knew 10 years ago, 15 years, 20 years ago. Nothing new in there. I would really say there's nothing new in there. Except we have a paper more, because we can publish this, Oprah and Health. So it's a black box problem. And I think we, I would really advocate for, we need to look at what is it that links the cultural, the different forms of cultural capital to health. And this is my second, uh, uh, this is how I try to conceptualize this. This is really in the making here. I think there's also a need to distinguish between individual and context-based cultural capital. The basic assumption here is that the effectiveness of cultural capital depends not only on how much you possess, but also how much there is in the context that you move in. So, and I did this little, uh, this little, uh, these models here, and I call it effect reinforcement through individual group concordance. So, imagine individual A, an individual possesses a lot of cultural capital, as I just described it. And he or she shares it with others in his or her social context. Well, that's mutually beneficial to all. That's great. That's the perfect situation. What if individual has, if this individual has a lot of cultural capital, but others have not? Well, then, it weakens 
the individual in the sense that there will be no echo and it may actually in the longer run reduce his or her cultural capital. And what if a group has a lot, but not all individuals or uh, only a few individuals um, have it? Well, that benef may benefit one individual, but it weakens the group. So this is just a, a thought experiment, but I think we can actually do empirical research on that. And in the second part, I'll show you uh, a little bit more about the data that we will have available for this. Now here we are, generic and health-specific cultural capital. Generic is education. You can apply this cultural capital to all issues. The ability to relate to complexity, uncertainty, multiple options, all comes from your personal and family experience, and you have this as a resource or you don't. It's generic. They are also health-specific. Those understanding, assessing, applying knowledge on the determinants of health. There's this group or context-based, for example, knowledge sources available in schools, in peer groups, virtual libraries. I would call this a generic resource on that, on the level of, on the group level. And there are health-specific, like values, lived experiences, without promoting conditions in a milieu, in your peer groups, and whatever. A few conclusions from these conceptual thoughts. Two hypotheses. I would dare to argue that it is actually the interaction between the different forms of capitals that explains much of the dynamics of social inequalities in health today. And we just don't have the appropriate research yet, but it will come soon. And second, if you want to change things in the terms of health promotion, I would argue that in affluent societies like ours, it's very different in uh, low- and middle-income countries. I'm absolutely sure. I'm not talking about that here. It's, I'm really talking about affluent societies. I would say that cultural capital plays a critical role in understanding how social inequalities and with it health advantages and disadvantages are reproduced. This is how it works when it goes real bad. That capital interaction, I call it the negative spiral. It's a downward spiral where actually when you lose your job and you lose your income or much of your income, you will very, this, this shows these are trajectories and histories that we have seen over and over again and described in the literature, you will be very likely to, use, uh, to lose your social capital. And very soon you will lose your sources for your cultural capital. And so the spiral works this way downward. But after almost 30 years in public health, I would not, not be in public health anymore if I would not believe in that there is possibility for change, and so I would argue that the spiral also works upward, uh, and that's a great, I would say, starting point for research, because what we would need to know is, what is the minimum amount of what sort of capital that people need to get the spiral working upward? And that would solve a lot of problems that we currently have in social inequality in public health. That it is, and it would clearly, or it would give us an idea where, until when, it's a money problem, and from where on, it's no longer a money problem. So, social inequality in health is not all about money, but it's always a bit about money. And it's not all about cultural and social capital, but always the bit about where are these level, levels of resource, uh, uh, stock of resource that people would need to get this going? It's a great resource question. You can even bring in economists. It would be great. 
And this is the final slide that brings it, that brings the, uh, brings it back to the larger structural agency theory, and which mentioned that at the beginning, yes, I am. I'm, I out myself as a structure agency researcher. I really try hard to develop this perspective further. And here you are. The three sorts of forms of capital interacting to determine the range of options that people have available, which then actually allows them to realize certain health and social behaviors effect on health status, but also going back here to this. This is the perspective we are working on, and uh, today is not <coughs> the time to talk more about this and the capabilities, uh, but that's another approach and uh, that we try to link, and you could read Amartya Sen for his theory on the capability approach. So far, but so good, well, questions, comments, new ideas, or we move on to empirical measurement. Your choice, structure and agency. Mm -hmm. I go at the structure, and now you have agency. of cultural capital works, own, works much better for these direct effects, but not so well for these indirect effects. So, for example, to know how to do a shoot-up, shoot up, that's okay, yes, inject heroin, uh, doesn't, doesn't really work here with the indirect effects. Uh, it's not a good sign for higher social status. Uh, but it does, it's, it's a competence 
you may, I don't know where, uh, how closely this is linked to uh, the cultural background, but if you grew up in a subculture of drug users, you will learn this there, and it, it may save your life. And it's a culture-based resource, a skill that you have acquired from your context that you're living. So this is basically, I think you are touching at a very crucial uh, issue here. But well, Jerry would not agree with me, and Jerry doesn't either, uh, because what they were interested in so much is uh, the distinction between the classes. And what I dare to do now is to take these insights about interaction and interplay of capital, which I think is great, it's a breakthrough. But I apply this also to understand the differentiation within classes and within subcultures. Who's more or less successful in these groups? And that will depend on the cultural capital that they have, on the resources and on the economic resources and so on. So the same principles of capital interplay apply and help us to understand why within certain cultures there are differences in power. It's still about power relations. Even in those, let's say, within some lower class sub-milieus, it's about power, very much so. And can we explain how this power is reproduced and that inequality within the classes? So, this is, uh, you are absolutely right. This is maybe sort of confusing for those who use the traditional approach that say that cultural capital and the capitals a la Bourdieu are only good for explaining the differences between the classes. But I would say, well, wait a minute. It, it, it helps to explain power differences within classes as well. And advantages and disadvantages, even among the sub-milieu or the milieu of drug users, I would say. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this up because, again, it makes me aware that uh, when I present these arguments uh, quite often, I run the risk that or, or overemphasizing capitals that individuals have. Once again, it happens to me all the time, uh, but I have a few more years to learn. Um, so I'm, I'm not advocating an approach that says capital is... Uh, the, the concept is most useful for explaining individual behavior, individual advantage, or so on. I always see individuals as social agents, as part of a milieu, a class, what have you. Always. Um, 
So it's not so not to be misunderstood on that. And in terms of that interplay between what an individual brings uh, to his group or gets from his group, that's basically, yeah, well, that is, um, that's a new idea. <laughs> so so uh, for me, it's a new perspective. And, um, and I think it is crucial in many respects. One respect, for example, is one could, we could speculate that an individual will, will not be member of a certain context or class for long if the concordance is not there. So this individual will leave this context very soon. And that's what makes for social reproduction of structures. This is structural reproduction, working through, with, and by individuals. Thank you. 
I admit, yes, I'm, I'm, I do not take into account these really individual psychological characteristics or processes that are also at work. I admit this, and that's part of my sociological focus, and that leaves out some, some of the others. One uh, issue you raise, uh, I think, is important, and pr uh, is definitely important uh, also for my thinking, and that's basically this one here. Uh, you say you would uh, pr prefer me to talk about assets, not capital, right? That's what you say. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Why, why should we use the term capital for that? These are resources, definitely, and we look at them. They, many of them are relevant directly, indirectly for help. Why capital? Well, here's, here's, an, here's an attempt to explain why. So come from cultural resources to cultural capital, uh, there are certain attributes. Not all resources are capital, but all capital is resources. But not all resources are capital. What makes resources capital? That they can, that cultural capital it is value-based meaning, that they can be systematically acquired and accumulated over time, they are convertible. There are payoffs through gains. So, in, so you have an investment. There are coefficients. So, so we we can do a prevention measure. We can slowly close here, or uh, we can uh, use ten more minutes, and I will show you examples of how we operationalize cultural capital for those of you who are uh, more in the number cruncher camp, uh, that, that might be a good thing to do or interesting to hear. And uh, if not, well, we, before we actually crack down like this, we, whatever. Rich, what do you think? Nothing that can be measured counts. And, and not everything that counts can be measured. Here it is. Unfortunately, not all. That's too bad. Um, well, I can't disagree in that. Okay. Um, we have a Strata and the highest time. The survey. You know, written questionnaire or something like this. Well, we have one in tiny little Switzerland. And how is that possible? Well, um, Switzerland still has, and I don't know for how long, but they have mandatory uh, military service. All young men that hold a Swiss passport uh, have to go through a conscription. Two days of tests. 
and we have a slot of one hour exactly by the second. They have one hour where they have nothing to do and they cannot run away from that camp. They are, just, they are there. They have nothing to do and then we present our questionnaire and we have a 95% response rate and we have them all. And that's a great source of data, I can tell you. So, um, we have all the sources of data. We have a written questionnaire, 500 residents, young men. Um, they have the privilege that we were responsible for a major part of that questionnaire, and we have the theory first. And usually with surveys is that we you know, bring in the theory afterwards, post hoc, so to speak. Here the theory was first in my new Actually, there was a competition, and I was actually quite optimistic that we would win. And so I had half a year time to prepare. And so we looked at how can we measure all these capitals. So it's theory guided, really. Uh, we will do the same thing for uh, until 2019. Uh, we did really very interesting. Time perspective is repeated cross sectional and it's probably 19 years old. So we are actually, we are having, we have a longitudinal study of young adults, not following individuals, but it, it's always the same age group and we can check how the social conditions for these age groups change over time. Really a special kind of data. We also have some uh, additional uh, survey uh, among uh, also 19-year-old women with very different type of data collection. So we walk door from door to door and actually collect data there. Uh, we can skip this. Now, how do we measure then cultural capital with all this theory on our bag, heavy uh, or light? Um, so. For example, we have education, as I mentioned earlier, which is the least accurate measure of cultural capital. We have different forms. So this is, we call it an educational, it's a training path. So where you move is this through high school, uh, undergrad, grad, on to your PhD. What is this high school? Then you, uh, we have a very differentiated uh, education system, so you can get higher education that is not geared towards science or whatever. It is really geared towards uh, high-tech professions, for example, so all kinds of so it's different tracks, so to speak. We have the education of the parents um, and uh, from both, and we have something, and I mentioned this before, something like number of books in parents' household. I don't know if you heard about this measure. It's very simple, but very good. It has high predictive uh, validity and strength. If you measure the number of books in a family, you can very well predict the school success of kids and their uh, occupation, their occupational status after 25 years. So it, uh, it was found in the European Social Survey. It was used there, and it's, uh, it's a simple measure that it's accident for uh, cultural capital within the family. And what we are using is actually parents' education degree plus number of books in structural equation modeling and, and create one uh, latent variable uh, that we call uh, family cultural capital. We also measure value like uh, importance of healthy working conditions, or this is an interesting one, workplace. So what we do is we ask these young men, would you be, uh, would you accept a health risk at your workplace if you, if your salary would be considerably higher? And, well, we don't have the analysis yet, but I expect that those who are in difficult financial conditions would be more likely to say yes. <laughs> oh, I, I, 
I forgot to mention, transcription, this is only the, uh, how do you call this, the test before actually you, you sign up for the army. Or you know, or you become an army member. So this is, everybody goes through, even those who have health problems and would afterwards not be admitted to military service. And, and it's mandatory. So usually everybody has to go except he has real health problems. Otherwise, they would have to go. So, uh, so this is, of course, it is a value, but you can look at it from a socially critical perspective because that value will be developed on the basis of what your material circumstances are. And we have it. We, for example, in the material circumstances, what we ask is the financial conditions in the family while they were young. So we follow the, the economic capital over time in the family over time. And uh, that helps us, I would say, to explain better how values develop and how they are basically uh, uh, class structured. Uh, financial strain, we ask them, do you have problems to pay your bills when it comes to, you know, the uh, daily, uh, what, uh, daily expenses, when it comes to your phone use, that's very important apparently among youngsters. Social capital, uh, we are pretty traditional on that. And uh, I got this great advice from Rich and uh, telling me, yeah, basically you are on the safe side. You can use these kind of measures. That's what you said. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, so it's basically belonging, uh, part of friendship networks. Uh, but here's an interesting one, a new innovation that we did. We asked them if there is a critical situation, do you or could, you parent, could your parents link you up with powerful others that can help you? So it's actually these kind of connections, we call them, that might be very helpful and very instrumental in you, become, uh, you uh, for success in your life. But do your parents have this kind of social capital that you can rely on in that? And of course, we have the trust measures. And perhaps this is the last uh, Last two examples where we actually look at combined effects in one variable, we have different forms of capital. So the social and economic capital. The abil ability to borrow 500 Swiss francs, which is something like 450 Canadian dollars. Uh, easily, can you borrow these easily? And then we have a list from your family, from your friends, from colleagues at work. Um, and we can add this up. And we would argue that this is an interesting measure of social and economic capital. Because you get it from your network, or you don't, and it's actually money. So it's economic capital that you actually draw from your, that you can easily draw from your social network. And uh, how well can you get advice from your parents when it's about your professional future. Uh, we see huge differences. There are some who uh, report, no way, uh, my parents would never ever be able to, you know, give me any advice on that. And others have. And uh, that's how advantage is reproduced, because this will, for some, lead into, uh, lead to uh, more professional success. It's actually a combination of social, cultural, and in the end, economic capital. Those are measures that we have either developed or adopted from earlier studies, and we apply to this very special data set. And uh, so either it might provide you with some ideas and uh, encourage you to also come up and develop new measures. Um, and also 
for me, it would be great if you have further ideas or tell me why those measures are actually not really convincing, then, that I, then I can learn something from here tonight. I think that's basically it. Thank you for your attention.